Hello everyone and welcome. This presentation is being pre-recorded for ISIS 2021 Data by Design, the ISIS Global Virtual Conference. This is going to be the best virtual ISIS ever. And this is part of the session on May 20th uh, for using student workers in the delivery of data services. What I'm going to give you is the long version of the talk and during the live session we will have a very abbreviated version of this talk and much more time for discussion. But this is the full works, the full background. Um, I'm still going to try to keep it relatively compact under 30 minutes. So I am Ryan Womack. I am data librarian at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, part of the New Brunswick Libraries. Um, I want to acknowledge our associate university librarian in Rutgers, New Brunswick, Dee Magnoni, who has participated in the development of what we're going to be talking about and has contributed uh, to the slides. And the title of this presentation is From Pilot to Jetstream, Building Training Pathways and Collaboration in Data Science and Digital Humanities Through the Library. And a sub subtitle to that is the Graduate Specialist Program at Rutgers New Brunswick Libraries, because that's the name of the program we're going to be talking about. Uh, this slide gives you kind of a, a table of contents of what we're going to be talking about. Um, I don't think it's interesting to talk through that, so let me skip ahead. Uh, to give you the background to what this is about, how it has evolved, uh, we're talking about the Graduate Specialist Program but that program has seeds in prior experiences. So I've been the data librarian for some time at Rutgers. I started giving R-based instruction in 2010, um, and I continue to do so. Uh, but over the years, there has been a constant demand for more instruction, more varied instruction, and a drumbeat of calls for Python which is something that, although I am familiar with Python, it is not uh, part of my advanced skill set. Um, and that's one driver. Uh, a second component is we've had an active digital humanities program at Rutgers since the hiring of Francesca Gianetti, our digital humanities librarian. And you're going to see how that comes into play. Uh, and Going back to 2015 or so, um, discussions started 2015, 2016 with faculty at Rutgers. Deborah Silver, who is in charge of the professional master's program, and Manish Parashar, who was in charge of the Rutgers Discovery Informatics Institute. Uh, he's actually now moved on from Rutgers. Um, and we worked on a grant proposal which wasn't ultimately funded, but a lot of the ideas uh, for this uh, were fleshed out there. Uh, that was a data science learning concierge where it was felt there was a strong need to have learning pathways for students to learn programming languages, learn data science skills outside of what they're getting in their coursework because the coursework sort of assumes, like you know some Python, you know some R, um, and then you jump in. Um, that program talked about hiring graduate students for teaching and consulting and for us in the libraries hiring non-library and information science graduate students was a big deal that we had not really done anything like that before um, and the ideas of building out our physical and virtual spaces and making use of the library as a friendly neutral third place uh, that can function like that on campus was all part of the discussion for this uh, grant that I think came back to help us develop this program. Uh, so we have a couple of slides here from the director's perspective. Dee Magnoni is our associate university librarian in charge of the libraries for the New Brunswick part of Rutgers. Rutgers is a multi-campus system across the state of New Jersey, but the New Brunswick campus is the R1 research university. It is the member of the AAU and a member of the BTAA. Um, so 
we see ourselves as a large public research university and we want to support functions that build that research capacity and help our students. Um, so we've had this foundation with our Digital Humanities uh, series of data management workshops with, with another librarian uh, that have laid the groundwork, but again there's been a call for more. And the pilot proposal that, that um, I had worked on and ultimately pitched to Dee as a way to deal with some of these issues would be a way to address the need for advanced research workshops and simultaneously provide opportunities for advanced graduate students, PhD students, master students to develop their own expertise in those areas. So we've seen this uh, as something that supports our strategic plan. This is a uh, image here that encapsulates our uh, major themes and goals from our most recent, uh, recently released strategic plan for the New Brunswick libraries. Um, and you can see that the themes uh, aug augment physical and virtual library spaces, enhance the research ecosystem, prepare stakeholders for professional readiness and success, and maximize our academic and societal impact. But this is going to address all those themes to some degree uh, and pretty much uh, address all three of the core goals for student success, strengthening research, building connections. So this program um, was defined as a pilot for the spring 2018 semester. Uh, just you know, see how it goes, flesh it out, and start to work work forward from that point. Um, to define the program, we you know we looked at other other models. We looked at the, again that background from the earlier grant activity, um, and as a data librarian, of course, I know, and you you guys in the audience here, uh, I'm sure know about other data services out there, uh, others at universities that have. Uh, the ability to have much more staff support brought in, brought to bear. Uh, at Rutgers, we haven't had that. We've had, you know, just a small number of librarians, um, and not really anything beyond that. That was limiting our capacity. We talked about this program being called Library Fellows, but uh, after some discussion um, to find a niche title that was not overlapping with anything else at Rutgers that might confuse people, which was very important, we settled on the title graduate specialist. So these are graduate students. Uh, they have specialized expertise and they're not to be confused with teaching assistants or uh, fellows or many other titles that exist at Rutgers, but graduate specialist worked for us. So you'll hear me uh, say that even when it may sound a little bit long and awkward uh, because I've been trained to, to uh, stick with that with that title. Um, so I've implied some of the other goals of this program already that we wanted to have this be a skill building opportunity for the graduate students. They're coming to us with some knowledge but we can give them teaching opportunities, we can mentor them in terms of directions to develop and give them an opportunity to really dig in and develop some you know course like teaching materials for their uh, their specialties we thought that we could tap into the large graduate school population at New Brunswick uh, as I just mentioned we had never hired anyone besides students from our library school which is now a master's of information program uh, at Rutgers uh, before in New Brunswick we argued, and this was an important component, that we we made a careful argument and succeeded in convincing our administration that for these advanced skills, we needed to have a higher wage rate to really draw the, the more talented students who might have many other opportunities. Uh, and so we paid $25 an hour instead of $15 an hour, uh, which we're still sticking to those levels. Um, you know, you're... Local conditions may vary a lot. For us, that was that was a significant step at Rutgers uh, for the libraries, at least, um, to be competitive with other 
other programs. Uh, so our initial focus uh, was really a couple of core areas. So we hired in spring 2018 uh, two. It ended up being two positions. There were, uh, as I'll mention, there were there was a third, which is part of our curve balls that I'll discuss. Um, a data services graduate specialist and a digital humanities graduate specialist with the idea that those students would report one to me and one to our digital humanities librarian Francesca Gianetti so that we could closely mentor them and supervise them. Uh, and these are the position descriptions that um, we put together. I won't read those out to you. So we, we, we completed that. We, we identified some excellent candidates um, in spring 2018, we marketed uh, to the graduate programs that we thought were relevant. Uh, not a full broadcast uh, kind of job ad that went out up on job boards, but simply sending our jobs ads to the departments that we thought would have those skills and also letting the graduate school uh, themselves know about this these opportunities. So. We, we tried to hire a qualitative uh, specialist uh, who we did hire, but unfortunately she had a family emergency that took her out of Rutgers um, uh, just as we were starting the semester. So that was our unexpected curveball of spring 2018 um, that put a little crimp in the program, which took us a while to get back to. Um, so here I will... Um, give you a little bit of something to look at besides uh, our slides. And as I go through, I'll clean up some of these um, tabs. But, you know, we put together a LibGuides page. Uh, LibGuides just a website building system, if you're not familiar with that, uh, for the program. And that was a place where we could describe what the program was about, where we could list uh, workshops that were available and we could list consulting hours for our specialists. Um, so this has changed a little bit and expanded over time as you can see that we now have a number of different topics that are being dealt with. Um, but setting that that site up was an, you know an important first step. Um, along the way it wasn't very well developed in spring 2018 but we, uh, for those who had content that was GitHub friendly, uh, we, we began to archive um, the workshop materials on GitHub uh, so that there was a common place that we were, we were building up our, our materials. In the, in, in that spring semester, we were teaching on-site in an existing digital humanities lab and our existing library classrooms, which um, were comfortable, but not ideal. Um, but that, that's how we started out. This is actually a snapshot of sort of a, a part of our uh, guides pages at an earlier moment in time with Alex Leslie, our initial digital humanities graduate specialist pictured there. Uh, and this is a snapshot of our current um, GitHub repository, which I just showed you uh, live, but it's also in the slide deck. Okay, so what happened after that spring 2018 semester? We had workshops on a variety of Python topics. Uh, one uh, person was coming from uh, the Rutgers Masters of Data Science uh, concentration and gave us a, a really nice suite of guided uh, introductory work with Python, data manipulation, data visualization, um, and provided consultation on Python and related topics. Um, the DH workshops uh, were on more specific researchy type of um, work using historical newspapers in the classroom, um, chronicling America, which is a a, a, a text uh, series that can be queried with with R, 
um, and consulting on R for textual, textual analysis, topic modeling, and geospatial analysis. So we had um, a, a decent number of people. Uh, when I report the numbers of who came, I'm reporting the number of people that registered. Uh, pretty much throughout, you can, you can divide that number by two. About half the people tend to show up who register. Uh, the registration number is a bit more firm and reliable and consistent for all of the workshops because the attendee count requires, um, especially online is a bit tricky that you know you have to kind of monitor the participants as they as they come in and watch for the sort of peak number that that occurs. And you know we have many different uh, graduate specialists. We didn't get that reported as consistently as the registrations. So just that's a word about the numbers. Uh, the feedback that we got, we also collected feedback forms on all our workshops. Um, and we found we hired really two uh, great people to start the program who were very um, self-motivated, very organized, and um, excellent instructors. So we got really great feedback. Uh, as you can see on this slide. Um, and so that gave us reinforcement that this, this could be a successful program and we could move forward with, with making it uh, more permanent. Uh, one problem though, you know, the workshops were very popular, but the consulting hours were sparsely attended. Our DH lab is on the fourth floor, the top floor of the library, sort of in a far corner. And it's a little hard to find if you don't know about it. Um, and we don't really have vehicles to advertise or market these things um, very easily. We have a very di dispersed uh, campus uh, with multiple campus locations connected by a uh, very large bus system. Uh, we have multiple libraries, and that awareness of here's something that's happening at a physical location has always been a bit of a challenge, and that showed up in the consulting hours. Of course, we got comments that you know people were looking for more. They're always looking for more topics that are focused on their needs, um, and they asked for more workshops, not more individual help. Uh, so we have continued to concentrate on building out the workshop content because those can be reused, we can make the content accessible, and we've continued to focus on that. The webinar, webinars were already being requested in spring 2018 for people who couldn't get on site, but we didn't do any webinars at that point. In 2019, we expanded the program to now have four specialists. Uh, we added a second data science person and excuse me that that's actually coming later uh, we added a qualitative specialist and an open science specialist so we wanted to explore uh, additional science data intersection type of uh, topics and those were except for Alex Leslie who was continuing those were three of them new hires and we did tap into the you know our graduate student community our master's community to get some really nice experts there so we now had content on in vivo uh, content on using github things like that and our registrations and attendance began to increase so by spring 2019 you can see these numbers have gone up to 104 Python registrants, 73 for DH topics, 21 for in vivo. The curveball in this case uh, was we learned a lot about the rules for international student eligibility. Um, the uh, it, it has varied over time, but uh, you know we have hired a number of students on international visas who are limited to 20 hours a week of work no matter what uh, no matter what the source is and so we because we're dealing with graduate students who have um, the other offers um, working as TAs and working in our program um, 
And because they're graduate students, you know, if that offer comes from the department that they're in, uh, it is more attractive in many ways uh, for building their career than our, we, we try to make our program attractive, but they, they are very tempted by those. Uh, and so we learn to be very careful uh, of when interviewing and discussing things with people to really uh, confirm more about eligibility after we had gotten caught by this issue um, unexpectedly in 2019. So, and we were quite busy expanding these, these programs. We still didn't, in 2019, implement any webinars. Little did we know what was coming around, around the bend. Um, so academic year 2020, uh, again, Python continued to be the, really the most heavily demanded topic. So here we, we moved away from the open science specialist to hiring two quantitative data specialists who would kind of overlap a bit with Python, but um, fan out to do some other different topics um, along with the DH, the qualitative, and a fifth person, a GIS specialist, which was new in 2020. Uh, we ended up uh, increasing our numbers in most areas, now up to 69 in vivo registrations, 18 GIS re registrations. That program was getting started uh, rather late, so it, in all these cases, it takes the students time to get up to speed, develop their materials uh, before getting going. Uh, you can see the new topics that were delved into, quite interesting. I'm going to keep things flowing for interest of time. Uh, this is our, our 2020 cohort of graduate specialists uh, at, at its maximum during that year. Um, and we've always had a, a great group. We'll see the, the most recent group live on the web page in just a moment. Um, but we've been lucky to have really great uh, specialists to work with. Uh, we can't do a presentation without some word clouds. I think these are uh, a little bit useful for getting a feel for the keywords of the topics that we addressed um, and some sense of their frequency. Uh, these are the departments that attended our workshop. So we, again, as we were collecting feedback, we found that there weren't really any strong patterns that we could identify, but for each workshop series, we were really tapping into a range of people from across the campus, um, sciences, social sciences. Obviously, the, the digital humanities content uh, leaned more to humanities people, but this, this is a word cloud of who came to our Python workshops. And, you know, I think you can see it's, it's, it's pretty wide ranging. Um, so, Feedback from this sort of middle stage of the, the process, which is where we would have been if, if I had been giving this talk uh, in person in Gothenburg in 2020, uh, was talking about the feedback from that year. Uh, again, we got a lot of suggestions for additional topics, including things like REDCap, which we are not the um, health sciences or medical people on campus. Uh, so there are some things that, that kind of go beyond what we would even consider, but certainly a lot of interesting topic suggestions. Um, people ask for getting the materials further in advance, better advertising. As, as I've said, we struggled with that. Uh, and always snacks, right? So that's, again, a flashback to that in-person world <laughs> where, where people wanted their snacks. Um, the pace and depth of content. Of course, people want great and clear instruction. We've always worked towards that. Um, but the pace and depth of content is, as I describe here, a Goldilocks problem. Some people are always going to find that you're going too fast. Some people are, are going to find that you're going too slow if they've already got some background. Um, and you have to build in, and we advise the students to build into their uh, materials, something for everyone. You know, something that the, that the beginner user is going to get something out of and something that the advanced user is going to get something out of. Okay, now here we get to the, uh, one of the exciting parts is um, 
our existing classrooms were just you know sort of banks of computers um, in on tables uh, very standard sort of old style uh, learning environment and we have had this goal to have more welcoming more flexible more modern space uh, to make our teaching more interactive things that we could adjust to the size of the group we could move around the room better we could have people in small group discussion um, and again thanks to our director's support we were able to renovate a room um, and implement that with highly mobile furniture everything in this room is on casters uh, the trapezoidal tables uh, can be rearranged into multi multiple different arrangements. Um, the, this, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this pyramidal uh, device is a uh, portable charging station, right? So you plug it in on the floor in one location, but you can push it near a table and it has multiple outlets. Um, we have whiteboards and what you don't see in these pictures because this is before the monitors arrive but we have big screen monitors to work with and we have um, the um, solstice boxes which allow anyone in the room to connect to the monitors wirelessly so you can actually uh, you know have people demonstrate things and make use of that so we, we renovated this space it was a really fun process designing that um, the the goal of this and we have a link here to our sort of more uh, full featured description is the goal of this space is actually to host interactive interdisciplinary discussion and what we would like to do in the future is is have this physical space be a nucleus of a lot of different kinds of research and technology uh, types of discussion. So things like, you know, we have, here's a Python workshop, here's an intro to Python, here's an intermediate Python, and by the way, let's have a Python discussion group or like Python methods in a specific discipline that can make use of this space to build community. So we've had that goal. And we got this space designed. We were very excited about it. And it, we, we held about three or four workshops in here before COVID <laughs> closed us down because it was only really ready to go in February 2020. Um, so we're hoping to get back to that, uh, but it's all been sort of on pause for a while. Uh, but this is our jet stream. So our pilot came in 2018. And a couple of years later, we had a this jet stream space. Um, the full acronym, you know, we we are serious that this is this is a space for transdisciplinary research methods, but you know, we, we've got a we've made it work into a into into an acronym. Um, this is also up on the fourth floor, the highest floor of the library, so that's another reason that we uh, call it the jet stream because it's supposed to be. Uh, fast-moving high-speed exchange of ideas going on up at that altitude so that's that's the jet stream I'm happy to talk about any of the any of these things in more detail um, when we get to live questions um, and of course our cur curveball in 2020 was COVID um, so within a couple of weeks everything moved from in person to uncertainty to complete closure uh, and what was really amazing was that because and, and I, it wouldn't have happened if we did not have our graduate specialists already in place used to delivering their content um, used to working with with the technology but m most of our um, specialists offered at least some of their workshops online and in some series almost all of them were, were converted to online which happened right away in the in that spring 2020 semester uh, we were forced into it but we finally succeeded with webinars we did that um, and in the we were uh, 
already prepared at that point to go fully online in fall 21. Um, so academic year 2021, which is just coming to a close for us right now, um, obviously all online. Uh, we not only delivered them in webinar format exclusively, but we, in most cases, the majority of cases, have been able to have recordings available so that people can access the content at any time. Um, this is an issue where you know we we want to make things as accessible as possible, but we also don't want to be uh, forcing or dictating things to our our specialists if they're not comfortable with certain things. So we do leave it up to a negotiation between the supervising librarian and the the graduate specialist student what exactly they'd like to do to make their materials available and so in some cases that has been making more printed uh, or you know textual guides available um, doesn't necessarily have to be a screencast recording um, so also I'll just as an aside we 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 took some of our longer, more complex job titles and boiled them down to, to more simple things. Uh, we found that we, we still are concentrating on core areas, data science, digital humanities, qualitative data. What we, what we really started with has been what we've continued with. Um, and of course, under COVID, we have had some budget restriction and we have not been able uh, we, we've slightly scaled back the program. We've had pretty good uh, continuing support from our director, but we haven't grown in the way that we would have in an ideal world wanted to. Um, so you'll notice the numbers here, right? So these are numbers for first fall and then spring. In the fall, I think, you know, we had this effect of it's an online world now. People are looking around for stuff, uh, and we just got this enormous surge of interest. So the registrations were way up in the fall, even up to 566 uh, for the various uh, Python workshops that occurred. That's over about uh, maybe 20 um, workshops. In the fall, we had real capacity issues. We had to cap the enrollments. Um, and those tailed off in the spring. You could blame Zoom fatigue. You could just blame getting used to the uh, world. Or you could also say that you know our stuff was not front and center in people's attention by the spring as well. Uh, we had a new series that was developed called Data Science Basics, which is is actually really has been quite popular um, on a level that even slightly higher than the Python uh, in some cases, and. I can sh let me let me sh take an aside and show you that. Uh, so on our um, graduate specialist page, we have our various topics. Uh, we have Python uh, with descriptions of the various workshops, links to recordings. Um, this is fairly typical of what we have. And so for data science basics, the idea here is is to have things available for people who are really nervous or really uncomfortable. They know that, that they've heard that this is very important. They want to get into it, but if, you know, someone's kind of jumping straight in quickly to a programming approach um, may, may be more than what they'd like, like to get. So, so the emphasis here is on beginner um, from the ground up um, how do you understand your data with spreadsheets? And then building from that to Python visualization. And you can see the, the way it's framed, demystifying Python programming language. Uh, that's turned out to be really quite, quite popular. Um, and I promised to show you our current group of graduate specialists. Uh, Sherry Cunningham is our longest serving one now. She's actually finishing up this semester. Um, our digital humanities specialist. We don't have a image here of one of our data science graduate specialists, uh, but there they are. And um, feel free to explore more in into those pages. Um, but you know, this has been our experience in 2021, like bringing people on board. Uh, 
in the in the middle of the year totally virtually that was something very new uh, we had three people leaving in after fall uh, that actually should say fall 2020 not 2021 um, which I'll touch up before distributing the slides uh, even before they graduated they, they got jobs because data science is hot at Red Hat Citibank uh, the gap um, so they were, we were excited that our skills were coming in uh, and our training was helping them actually move forward in their careers. Um, I've included a quote here from one of our uh, students describing um, their experience. We did find that, that people were telling us that uh, that experience, you know, like a lot of people in data science, they're just plowing through the coursework, they're completing their projects, they're, they're doing their modeling, but being able to demonstrate that you can get up in front of people, you can communicate, you can um, actually share your knowledge with a whole group of people and develop learning materials has uh, been very valuable, I think, to to our students. Um, so we, you know, we've been very happy about that part of things. Um, what it also meant was that we had to hire people in spring 2021. Um, without ever meeting them face to face. Uh, and again, fortunately, we have very mature and very capable graduate students to work with, and that has worked out. Um, but, you know, I'm always conscious that uh, one of these days we'll have, a, have an experience that is not such a great fit. Um, and, you know, we have to, we have to be careful uh, not to uh, have too many expectations just because our existing students have been great and easy, easily able to manage things. Uh, we still need to help them along the way and be aware and supportive. Um, so I've actually, this slide we can skip past because that's mostly duplicated. Um, I want to talk now about the, the collaborations that have developed out of this. So we've seen a program that has, in terms of delivering workshops, has grown. Uh, it's not in the slides, but in terms of individual consultations, the individual consultations remain small. Uh, it's mostly students who follow up after um, already coming to a workshop. Then they get to know the instructor, and then they come back for more help. Um, but a side effect of this program has been that we have uh, built our campus collaborations. So one thing that happens is people will see a workshop and they'll say, hey, that's a really interesting topic. Can you come and give it to my department or my research group or uh, to, to my class? And that has happened uh, throughout the process. And sometimes um, I will uh, work with the students to tweak materials for the class um, or you know if that's a specific context but I think it shows that, that our stuff is relevant you know it's not just like this one-off workshop thing it's it's also getting demand for being brought into the classroom um, we we have built a relationship with our office of advanced research computing so they offer their own workshop series that are more focused on getting people to use the high performance computing cluster and some of the technical details of that you know that is um, how do you submit jobs how do you log on to the system how do you do this uh, but they have people who also need help just with some basic things like python uh, with with r so they have been happy to list our workshops to their audiences and to refer people to our workshops. And we have started cross-listing their workshops on our calendars so that people know about the, the HPC resources and they're able to you know, find out about those and attend those. Uh, we, building on that initial cross-listing, we said, what if we have a special series where we take our approach uh, and this is also for me as well for my R workshops, but our graduate specialists did it for Python. Uh, we, we teach people some of our just, here's how you use R, here's how you use Python, but put it in the, the machine learning context on the cluster. Our cluster is called Amarel. Amarel is the 
name of the um, the large cluster system. So in the process of our workshop, they learn how to get an account on AMRL. They learn how to run these commands on AMRL. They learn how to launch a, a RStudio on AMRL. And you know that has just started. Actually, I would say that those workshops weren't as polished as I would have ultimately liked them to be, be just starting out. But we're going to keep building and improving that uh, collaboration. A second collaboration. This is very exciting. Um, this is something where our, our physical space mattered, uh, and surprisingly, that is carried over to the virtual world. So uh, there is a program called the Erdos Institute. Uh, there's a link here if you're not familiar with that. This is a program that started out of Ohio State, and it is a um, initiative to train PhDs who are mostly in technical science areas for skills that may help them in industry placement, right? So it's like alt-ac, alt-academic uh, track is the ultimate goal of this um, institute. But one of the major things that they do is they sponsor a data science boot camp. Now that data science boot camp had been in person at Ohio State as another Big Ten school, they wanted to expand to Rutgers. They wanted to hold an on-site boot camp for us in spring of 2020, which we were going to host in our new Jetstream space. Um, but COVID happened, right? So COVID happened, and what came out of that was was maybe even more interesting, which is you know we were already on board to participate, and they said let's make it a nationwide virtual event. And so our graduate specialists became TAs, and I kind of tagged along for that also. I, I was a teaching assistant for this process and actually built my Python skills a bit. Um, and the first year was 129 students, um, including about 20, I think, at Rutgers last year. Uh, and that number has gone up to over 300 this year with about 60 Rutgers students um, participating in this. It's a it's a one month long boot camp with uh, classes, not full day classes, but hour and a half long classes every day for the first three weeks, and then time for the students to work on their capstone project for the fourth week. Um, and we could have only you know, the libraries have been part of that only because, one, we had that space as a carrot initially, and because we we actually now have the students with the skills to step in and provide support, right? We would have never had uh, the ability to say, hey, we have people who can be TAs for you for, for Python machine learning um, before we had this program. Um, so that's Erdos, who's in that screenshot. Um, another benefit, uh, another improvement that's happened is, you know, for the first two, for two, two years of this program, our listing of workshops was really just manual. There were lists on those LibGuide pages of here's what we were offering. And that was very frustrating, especially from an updating point of view. You have to update across multiple tabs. Um, and we had a, a patchwork of tools to take care of different things. Register, get feedback. Um, here's where your course materials are. All this uh, stuff together. Um, and we'd, we'd had access to this SpringShare product called LibCal, but we had never had an impetus to use it. In, at Rutgers before, uh, but as a result of the graduate specialist program and pushing for this need for workshops, we um, gained access to this LibCal system, and our workshops were really the first implementation at Rutgers. So this has a very nice system that enables you to um, search and filter for a number of different uh, Topics, and I'll just go back in time to something that might have 
I think that's our spring break. Yeah, so this is, um, let's do, I want a day that's more busy than that. Well, this is, this is maybe suitable. Um, this is a typical, uh, what you typically see during the semester. Right now we're after the live workshops. Um, so this gives us a way to list the workshop once, list the description once, um, build in the registration uh, that's easily managed in the same application. Uh, you can manage a waiting list. You can notify all your registrants. You can provide them with links to guides and materials all through this, the back end of this interface. Um, and also on the slides, I've provided you a, a link. This is a view as of February 21st, the monthly view for February, sorry, February 2021, um, to give you an idea of, okay, this is where we were a few months ago. The, the workshops that were available to students at Rutgers. And when people came to the library site, they saw these workshops and our workshops. Um, some of these workshops are things that are offered by the supervisors of the specialists. For example, the, the R ones are mine. Uh, some of these are our digital humanities librarians work. But we had a presence that was really um, so much larger than it would have been without this program in a virtual environment. You know, before we had the specialists to offer all these things, we would have just had a handful of visible stuff during the pandemic. And I, I think I think that's, been, again, been very important for us at the, at the libraries to say, you know, hey, we're not just this physical pile of books. Um, we have all these other services here, take a look. Here's here's what we've got, um, and I think it 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 is visible to people, particularly in this environment. At times in the past, you sometimes feel like you're you're trying to make that case to people, and you, they can't get beyond that image of the libraries as the pile of books, and they don't. It doesn't really stick with them that there's all these other things that the libraries do, but this has made it really visible for us. So uh, we had major benefits from adopting this platform for this academic year. It, it lets us cross-list those workshops much more easily as well. Um, that's a plus. I'll keep moving here in the interest of time. And also this academic year, uh, the whole model of working with graduate students uh, in this way to target them for their advanced skills, and to have close mentoring relationships. You know, I'm, I'm sure that, that many of you in the audience have already been doing that for a while, but uh, outside of training uh, assistants to work at the reference desk or to teach library classes, not something we had done at Rutgers uh, before this program, but we opened the door with the graduate specialist hiring model and we had two new programs starting this year, one called IDEA, which is um, this link, um, Innovation Design and Entrepreneurship Academy. This is a special program for Rutgers freshmen to come in and learn about design thinking approaches. Uh, but we have graduate specialists who are supporting those student teams and working with them in their small group discussions and on their projects and consulting with them. Um, which has been great. Uh, and another very brand new one is we have students who are working, uh, this, is, this one's in the pilot stage, on intensive literature review. This is a targeted research service to faculty where they're almost like short-term research assistants, um, but for us, they're working under the umbrella of this graduate specialist style model. The other really interesting thing about these is that the libraries are not paying for them. Uh, the, the external departments are paying the salaries, the wages of the of the students uh, because they saw that this could work for them. As long as we we are investing our time to have librarians manage and mentor them, but the external cost is that you know 
is minimal because the other departments see value in this and they're funding us. So that's enabling us to grow into new services, new areas that we have not uh, been able to do before. All right, so let me wrap this up. I'm already pretty long. Um, the impact of this program uh, is one, we have hundreds of students trained to use advanced research tools. We have currently 14 different graduate specialists who have come through, been hired by the program, and been given valuable teaching and instructional development experience. We have built this archive of online material, and I'll just flash back to our GitHub uh, here, um, in, if anyone's interested in exploring that. Um, that we, we are growing over time, uh, including video uh, recordings of various trainings. We've built up our physical and physical spaces. We've improved our virtual uh, spaces just by building that online content archive. Um, and we're now seen as much more relevant by other units on campus. We, we have something to offer in a collaboration. We can work with others and, and really give them something rather than just saying, hey, please include us, we're, we're the libraries. We, they want to bring us in because we have something to offer. And I think this has been transformative, um, at a, especially at a time when the budget is a problem, period. Uh, we can't hire uh, you know, tons of staff or any staff really very easily, but we can leverage the people that we have by, and I, I view it that way, that it makes me more valuable to the university um, if I can supervise and mentor a group and broaden the range of instruction that's all kind of coming out of the seed of, of, of data knowledge. And I'm helping that, that group grow. It's not just me anymore giving those workshops, but this larger group um, and an accumulation of content over time. And um, this slide just has a few other concerns or topics. You know, there is this issue of we have repeatedly been in the situation of trying to hire someone at the beginning of a semester, um, getting them on board very quickly, getting them ready to teach very quickly um, and that's a challenge it's a challenge that gets easier the more older material you you have and you can say hey if you're comfortable just teaching that older one teach that for now until you develop your own um, another one is the um, sort of evolution of data science uh, i find so for this audience particularly i'm interested in your thoughts um, a few years ago, data science was new to a wide audience, but now we're at a point where uh, some people may have already been targeting this since high school, uh, and they, they may not really be interested in the intro materials. Uh, finding something that's suitable for a short workshop but still interesting to them is, is something that we always have to work on. What's the next wave of of interest. And so the, 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 those topics are a moving target. Um, sometimes we have we build these things around resources that are available to staff. Um, I'm specifically talking about the technology tools like the LibCal and there's a little barrier of getting the students uh, into those systems, things like that. And of course the big one, sustainability. Um, we are, um, you know, dedicating some of our some of our library funding to this, and any expansion or any you know future directions, I think, do depend on building a case for more external resources to support them. Okay, so in the future, I, I'm I'm not going to dwell on this slide because we've I think talked about this throughout that we want to get back to our physical spaces, but continue the virtual world work. Um, we want to improve mentoring 
and I've already talked about building out collaborations and adapting to new topics. So let me close it here. Um, and if you're watching this online and, and you're missing the live presentation, uh, feel free to contact me. Here's my email. There's some more contact information on my website. Um, any questions, anything you want to discuss, I'm very happy to talk about um, anything data related, especially with I Assisters, that would be wonderful. Um, and so thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for being at the best virtual I Assist ever. Spasiba, uh, Baitla, Mashik Baitla, and uh, whichever preferred uh, language you have. Thank you again. Uh, let me sign out here.